Yeah. So, you know, just to just to reiterate, it was, you know, Lyndon Johnson that was in charge at the time when this project Oxcart um, was going on. And I want to go back to this article here that was published up um, by the National Interest on October 21st of 2021, which is an interesting date. 1021 is an interesting number for me. Um, for personal reasons. But anyway, I want to go back to this article here and share a little bit more information on the pilot requirements too. But in this particular memo here, you know, when we're speaking about um, UFOs and unidentified flying objects, which now they are calling it UAPs, which for a while was called uh, unidentified aerial phenomena. phenomena. And then I think it's very curious that um, shortly after I sent in my Sky Anomalies report, which was a report on anomalous activity here in Las Vegas. And the word anomalous is actually in my report that I sent in to several different agencies. And all of a sudden, UAP becomes unidentified anomalous phenomena. And then all of a sudden, uh, the UFOs over Vegas guy who had become famous for UFOs over Vegas channel decides to change his channel to... Uh, anomalous Vegas. So I just find that the timing of all of these changes of the terminology and the wording and everything is really curious to me. But anyway, in this particular memo that was sent out uh, back on May 18th, 1962, and again, because I'm repetitive, I got to say it again to remind y'all, Johnson was in charge. The same Johnson that uh, gave the speech that we've all heard, many of us have heard many, many times, and it reverberates in our brains. What lays the equipment and the foundation for a so I find it curious that he would be the president in charge that would give the phase out because there's a phase out uh, document here too uh, from April 17th of 1968 that I wanted to share a little bit of information concerning the phase out of the Oxcart program. And remember it was in 64 um, when Johnson finally actually, you know, outed the program to the public and it became known to the public that it was actually going on. But prior to that, there's all these different memos that you can read and I'll put a link in the description. But in this one here from 1962, they talk about one flight that was made and the accomplishments and, and stuff and how they reached Mach 1.1, 1.3. And again, it says uh, aircraft reached Mach 1.1 to 1.3 in climb. And after a leveling out at 41,000 feet, reached Mach 0.141. But, you know, your leveling out means that you're actually having to nosedive the entire time to account for the curvature goal, right? And just saying, I just have to reiterate, put that out there. If you can go that fast then your piloting program and your manual would definitely reflect the data that, you know, if, if you really wanted to put forth this whole theory about the curvature, just publish that pilot manual for the A-12, because I want to see where it shows that they have to constantly nosedive to account for the curvature to prevent themselves from flying off out into space. Anyway, um, I want to talk about the second flight. A second flight was scheduled, but during the post-flight inspection, it was found that the thin skin at the trailing edge of both vertical fins was cracking and pulling away from the first three rows of rivets. I bet when you're going that fast, right? Over approximately 30% of the span, this will necessitate a small redesign and modification. The fins have been shipped to LAC for repair this weekend, and the next flight is scheduled for Tuesday, 22 May. Kelly says that they will start to move up in altitude in order to increase true speed next week. And now it says LAC will shut down flight operations Thursday, 24 May for approximately 14 days for resealing of tanks 1 and 5. The runway shoulders will be slurried at this time. And here's a curious thing here. There were four unidentified aircraft in the flight test area today, meaning Area 51. However, we do not feel that any of them were near enough to compromise security. They were apparently all transients, but none from, and then they have it redacted, but it's Area 51. Okay, we already know that this was being tested and developed there in Area 51. So I just think that's curious that they would use those terms that they, there was unidentified aircraft in the flight test area, but they didn't feel that it compromised their security. So was that part of the plan, you know, that this unidentified aircraft was there to kind of photograph it from a distance and get this blurry images and different things? I don't think they phased it out. I really don't. I think they continued it and that it's what they've been using to create this whole deep space weather situation. But 
in this phase out document here from 1968, um, it goes into some of the, you know, the considerations affecting the Oxcart program phase out, of course, you know, I don't think that they, this was all just a bunch of mumbo jumbo as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to scroll down to another document that was published on March 7th, 1968, because all of this here talk, this talk here about all this phase out stuff, it was just a, a, probably yet another cover story that they used for the actual military personnel that would have to be involved in transferring the program over because they ultimately just transferred it over to SAC, right? But um, in these different options, they talk about uh, a memorandum for the Deputy Secretary of Defense dated March 7th of 1968, a study of options for continuing operation of the Oxhart aircraft in fiscal year of 1969. So they talk about option one, option two, three, four, and all that. And I just, I want to scroll through a lot of that because a lot of it just seems like a bunch of mumbo jumbo because it seems like they already had it planned out. But they're talking here about um, put, you know, assessing the commonalities between the Oxcart and the SR-71 aircraft so that they would be able to transfer, transfer the whole program over to another facility, more specifically to Beale Air Force Base. And they talk about... Um, the Air Force has reviewed the feasibility of options calling for operation of the Oxcar aircraft by SAC Strategic Air Command from the standpoint of training, maintenance, facilities at Beale Air Force Base and contractor support and has concluded the options and schedules described above are feasible. However, there are substantial differences in the configurations of the Oxcar and SR-71 aircraft in the areas of cockpit, instruments, sensors, engines, and the airframe. If commonality in subsystems were to be sought between the two aircraft, a considerable expenditure of time and money would be required for modification. Therefore, the options considered contemplate only the operation of the Oxcar aircraft in their present configurations. This would require formation of specialized units within SAC capable of maintaining and operating the Oxcar aircraft as is. Conversion of as much of the maintenance from contractor to military personnel will require substantial improvements and the technical data available for the Oxcart aircraft. Continuation of essentially the current level of contractor maintenance and overhaul services would be required until the SAC unit were manned and trained. However, because of the small number of Oxcart aircraft and their special subsystems, the continuing level of contractor support would continue to be greater than that utilized for the SR-71. These factors were taken into account in estimating the operation costs, okay? And this talks a little bit more about continuation. Continuation of the Oxcart program into fiscal year 1969 under any of the options discussed herein will not only require additional procurement of spares, age, and other equipment in the Oxcart program, but will impact the SR-71 program since uh, redacted of such items common to the SR-71 and Oxcart programs have not been procured for the SR-71 in fiscal year 1968 on the assumption that Oxcart assets would become available in fiscal year 1969. They have a whole section here uh, redacted and they talk about uh, security would require special attention under all of the options calling for transfer of the Oxcart aircraft to Beale Air Force Base. The most difficult problems would arise in connection with option three in which a CIA would continue to operate aircraft at Beale Air Force Base. This option has not been reviewed with the CIA and if implemented, might require additional buildings and other facilities at Beale Air Force Base, not included in the present cost estimates. In the interest of maintaining security separation between the Oxcart and the SR-71 programs at Beale Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. Options one to three, however, all call for development of a plausible explanation for the surfacing of these additional aircraft. Uh -huh. Differing in configuration from either the the YF-12A or the SR-71. These security problems have not been addressed in the current study, but will require detailed attention if implementation of any of the options one through three were contemplated. So in other words, you would have to explain to all these people involved at Beale Air Force Base all of the information and stuff available from the SR-71. So you'd have to really make sure, and then and, uh, on the ox cart and all that, you really would have to make sure that you had people that you could blackmail, right? Because you wouldn't want the information to get out that you were sourcing materials and doing things connected with the Soviet Union either, right? And you most certainly wouldn't want it to get out that, you know, the president had ordered for this program to be discontinued, but you're over here planning and planning on your different options on how you can continue the program classified. I'm just, to me, that there shouldn't be no privacy up there. I'm sorry, but... Um, we have no reasonable expectation of privacy down here at ground level. There should be no expectation of privacy up there either. There needs to be a little more transparency in what they're allowed to zip around up there above our heads. Because I do believe that this has got, this this particular program 
is, is one of the programs that they continued and that they've been using to control the world's cloud layers. I'm sorry to reiterate once again, because you're probably tired of me being repetitive, but Johnson was in control. The same Johnson that said that he who controls the weather will control the world. It lays the medics in the foundation for the development of a weather satellite that will permit man to determine the world's cloud layer. And ultimately, to control the weather, and he who controls the weather will control the world. To control the weather, to control the 